Mulvaney, all the way from Britain, actually. Really? A British author from Maryland. But I uh, got a great new book out about polar bears, and you can win a book. You can win a book, an autographed copy. We've got Terra by Night, Basil Rathbone, coming on at 9 o'clock. Kay Genovese is here in the house. She can sit down anytime she'd like. Uh, Kate's been on visual radio, oh, God, 10 years back, and Karen Mulvaney is here. Hello, Kate. Wherever you'd like to sit. Would, would you like to sit in the middle and have yeah, Karen here? Yeah, yes. Yeah. Joe LaRocker, our station manager. I just like to do things real laid back. Okay. And that, that, it was fun seeing the wonderful show. And I got some wonderful yeah. ideas for the wonderful show. They can throw things at me. But remember, I produced the great Harvey Warfield back in 92 on CGY 93.7. I wrote to Harv today, said, Harvey, come out to Winchester so Harvey Warfield might, yes. might actually... Uh, the legendary number one DJ in Boston, Harvey Warfield, might come out to the show again. He's been on visual radio, of course. Um, the Great White Bear, a natural and unnatural history of the polar bear. We're going to get into it with Karen, and we're going to talk to Kay Genovese. She has table talk in Woburn. She's had Ed Walker on, Healthy Hypnosis, which is a show we air here. And you're going to bring him over here, right? Healthy hypnosis guy? Sure, Paul, yeah. Paul. I love that. He is all over the place. Yeah, Kieran, very good. this hypnotist is on, I'm on about 24 stations. He's on, I think, more than I am. Uh -huh. Yeah, he is like 80 something. Unbelievable. Yeah, he's very good. Is he mic? Um, the phone. Oh, the phone's going to be mic? Sorry, I'll be mic. I'll be mic. Goody. And, and we have the phone for our Bela Lugosi biographer. Do you like Bela? Who doesn't love Bela? <laughs> Do you like Bela? Same, yeah. We had a whole Bela Lugosi. I think Joe and I must have played eight movies in eight really? weeks. We, we just had a fast, a Bela fest. Really? Uh. And I, I, I rang up Frank. I've known Frank for years. He's in Texas, and he just started having fun, and he calls in every week. It's, it's awesome to have a, a biographer call in. And, wow, wow, yeah. Uh, his his uh, essay on, on Sherlock three weeks ago was really brilliant. Hmm. I mean, just stuff you don't get on Access TV. Right. And we rarely get guests in on a Friday night. We're honored to have you here. Thank you. It's great to be here. I really appreciate it. Uh, and once I know everything's rolling... It's all completely oh, good. Oh, everything's completely good, including the visual radio banner behind you. Explain how it's the first show now. <laughs> okay, this is the first live show. We did Soapbox for a year. It was a lot of fun. We took phone calls. Uh, we will have sports host Johnny Byers calling in every week. Not tonight. I told him not. He's watching the Celtics. He calls in and... Around the 820 mark gives us a, an update on the Celtics and the Bruins. And it's fun. He's a legendary sports host around the town. And then we have Frank. And we usually have phoners. So, Karen, having you here, and I hope I'm saying your name right. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Having you here is great. It's an honor to launch our first show with a live guest instead of a phone guest. All right. In studio. And have Kate here. It's just. Yeah, it's great to be here. I, haven't, I think I've done a live show. It's nice oh. that I'll be able to go down in history as your first life guest. I'm pretty excited about that. Well, on visual radio, yeah, because, yeah, um, at another station we did a trimal cast back in the day before people were broadcasting on the web. Now everything's on the web. Right. But back in the day we did uh, AM 1670, a TV station, and the web, and it was, it was difficult coordinating it all way back when. But this is, this is going nice, and you are our first, and we thank you. Oh, cool. Now this is that's that's there the old go. school and I love it. <laughs> um, Pretty old school. You slipped your chair up, Joe. Maybe old school works. You know? So you are at the museum. Yeah, the Harvard Museum of Natural History tomorrow at uh, two o'clock. Doing a little talk about polar bears and uh, showing some pictures and talking about some of my experiences up uh, uh, watching them up in Canada and off Alaska and off the Russian Arctic. So. Uh, yeah, anybody's welcome to come along, and hopefully there won't be too much snow in the morning, and people will be able to actually able to make it in. I don't know. I think we were saying earlier, you guys are going to get three inches, which is nothing to you guys at this point, right? Um, it's been a very difficult winter, a very trying winter. Yeah. But um, where is that? Do you know? Is it in Harvard Square? 
Yeah, I believe so. It's right down there. I, I checked uh, earlier, and it sort of seems to be right there in, in the heart of Cambridge, along with, with everything else. Oh, so people else. can get on the bus? As far as I know, yeah. And it's open to the public? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, admission free. So, so um, we're going to ask you to read a little bit tonight. Are you going to do that tomorrow? Yeah, probably we'll do a little bit, yep. And we've got giveaway books over the coming weeks. You can call in and get a book, and Kieran is kind enough. He'll autograph them. I certainly will. I'll put my, my ugly little scroll in there. Let's, Kate and I, get into the heart of it. Um, this is your third book. What possessed you to write this important story? Well, I mean, I've always actually been attracted to the polar regions, to, to the Arctic and the Antarctic. Uh, I mean, I lived in Alaska for eight years. Um, I've uh, been fortunate enough to go to the Antarctic several times. And um, one of the things that really got me going is I was actually working with um, a couple of explorers who aimed to become the first guys to make it to the North Pole across the sea ice of the Arctic Ocean in summer. No one had ever done it in summer before. Most people do it in spring when there's light, but before the ice is melted. These guys wanted to try and do it while the ice was melting, just because they could. Mm -hmm. um, and and uh, at first I thought I wanted to write something about them, and I talked to my agent about that, and we thought, eh, maybe that's not quite going to work. And they started telling me about all their experiences with polar bears, and of course polar bears are in the news, everybody knows about polar bears and talks about polar bears, and I thought, yeah, you know what, everybody knows about the, a little bit about polar bears, that they're big and they're white and they're in trouble, but there is very little out there about what makes a polar bear a polar bear. Um, uh, you know, what is it? What makes them tick? What is the nature of polar bears? And uh, so I thought, yeah, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to write something about polar bears. I'd, I'd been fortunate enough to see some in the wild before, and it was an incredibly uh, impressive and ins inspirational experience. And this gave me the opportunity to see them in the wild some more. And how much research? It seems like you did quite a bit of research. Yeah, the beauty of it um, was finding the right people. Um, and being directed to, there's a very small, really, group of scientists who've done the bulk of field research on polar mm -hmm. bears. And I was able, through a couple of other folks, to, to get in touch with some of them. And so much of the work had already been done on one level, and that they'd spent so many years uh, studying polar bears and writing scientific papers and so on and so forth. And then I had the opportunity to go out to this one place called Churchill, Manitoba, the polar bear capital of the world, where uh, a lot yeah. of polar bears and a lot of people and a lot of researchers gather and spent a fair bit of time there, and that was incredibly helpful. Yeah, yeah. yeah all in all, I think the book probably took a couple years mm -hmm. to do. Um, you know, not at, not at breakneck speed at any time, but mm -hmm. um, yeah, I would say with, with research and writing, probably a couple of years. Mm -hmm. Polar bears in the Antarctic compared to the Arctic, is there a difference? There are no polar bears in the Antarctic. They're only in the Arctic. Um, the polar bears up, up in the Arctic, penguins in the Antarctic, outside of a Christmas card or a cartoon, you'll never see the two of them together. Hmm. With, with the trouble in the Arctic, can they m be...? They'd never survive, um, basically apart from anything else. They, they feed on seals. The whole nature of being a polar bear is to feed on seals. And obviously there are seals in the Antarctic, but they also need to be able to wander around the sea ice and, and grab seals through cracks in the ice. If there's lots of open water, they can't do that. And the big difference between the Arctic and the Antarctic is the Arctic is a frozen ocean surrounded by land. The Antarctic is a frozen continent surrounded by ocean. And what happens in the Antarctic is the sea ice breaks up, the seals all disappear out into the water and the polar bears would never get them. And they'd be left ashore and they'd eat all the penguins in Antarctica and they'd be done with them just like that. So polar bears could never survive in the Antarctic. Has anyone, do you think, um, moved any polar bears there just to see? You know mm. who people are. Yeah, do you know what? There was actually one time a ways back, I can't remember what prompted it, but someone tried to do something the other way around and see if penguins could survive up in the Arctic and that didn't work so well either, you know. Interesting. But, yeah. Yeah, that was quite some time back, off, off an island off Norway or something. They decided to see if these penguins could survive, and I don't know that they made it even a year. What, what else do they eat besides? Polar bears. They, uh, seals. That's pretty the much seals. it. They are supremely adapted specialists. They really focus on seals. I mean, you look at them, they are, they are eating machines. Their teeth are all carnivore teeth, you know, sharp and pointed. Um, they're, they're not the kind of animals that are meant to, you know, chew on berries or plants mm -hmm. or anything like that. Uh, they very specifically, and in fact, um, it's very much not even just seals, it's the fat specifically of the seals, the blubber. Um, the, a lot of times a big healthy bear, if it doesn't have to, won't even eat much of the meat on a seal. It'll just rip off the layer of fat and gulp it down 
And then it's the, it's the less successful polar bears, the younger ones that can't, that can't hunt as easily, then they'll go and like pick the carcass or an arctic fox, something like that. But yeah, they, they have evolved to eat spe seals and specifically a species called the ringed seal. And the ringed seal uh, is a particular target because it has these great little claws on its flippers. And what that allows the ringed seal to do is carve little holes in the ice so that it can pop up to breathe. So it doesn't have to look for cracks. It, wherever it is, if it's swimming under the ice, it can carve these little holes. And that's great for the ring seal. It enables it to, to, to survive. But it also means if you're a smart polar bear, and polar bears are very smart, all you have to do is find the holes in the ice, and you just sit there and wait, and eventually a ring seal is going to pop its head up. And so a lot of times you'll find polar bears will just sit and wait by these holes in the ice. So did you observe this as well? I've never, I've never seen a polar bear kill, kill a seal. I've seen them sometimes go through um, the kind of behavior that they sometimes do because ring seals also build little dens on top of these, these, these holes that they, they wow. haul out of. Isn't it just amazing what animals instinctively oh, know how to do? It's incredible. And that they're, like, they're like little palaces in there, you know, with the little snow crystals and so yeah. on. And sometimes a polar bear will just go up and it'll figure that a seal is in there and it'll leap down onto, onto, mm -hmm. the, uh, onto the den and try to kill the seal. I've seen them do that, but there not be a seal in there. Um, but uh, yeah, most of the time I've just seen them kind of ambling around and wandering around. And life of a polar bear involves a lot of walking and a lot of waiting and a lot of patience with brief bursts of excitement and, anxiety and, and action when they get a chance to hunt a seal. Mm. So that's basically what their existence is about. It is, it and is. And what if you, if you saw a polar bear, but you really wouldn't? I mean, just how, how does it respond to humans? You know, what I found is that, because they're super, super intelligent animals, I mean, they're really, really very smart and very adaptable, and I found that they have their own personalities, and different bears respond in different ways, and oh. it really depends on the circumstances. Um, I've had bears just be completely indifferent, um, bears be kind of curious, um, mm -hmm. and you know, I've never, fortunately, been in a position where I'm just walking along the ice and just, or, or anywhere and just bump into a polar bear. I've always been, say, on a viewing platform right. or, on, an, or right. on a ship. Um, and sometimes they would look at like our ship and they might hiss a little bit because they're not sure what this thing is that's coming into their environment. I never hear them roar. I never hear them vocalize. The only sound I've ever heard a polar bear make is sometimes they hiss like cats when they're a little bit afraid. Um, uh, um, but other times they just don't care. Sometimes they're really curious and they want to investigate you and see what's going on and see what you are and have a good sniff yeah. and get as close as they can. So I was reading that the baby polar bears hang around with their mother until they're two or three yeah. or something like that. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, um, they're born, amazingly enough, for such a large animal, they're born in a snowdrift. It's the most amazing thing. Um, w when a polar bear mother becomes impregnated, she doesn't, the embryos don't develop initially. She becomes impregnated in the spring and then she keeps the embryos and then come fall, when it's time to give birth, she'll dig a hole in a snowdrift. And that's where, the, that's where the cubs are born. Fascinating. Yeah. And they will come out there and they will live with, um, they'll live at mom's side for two, two and a half years. Like, they won't leave her side. It's amazing to watch. Like, she'll be walking along and they will, they will keep right by her feet. Mm -hmm. um, and as they get bigger and bigger, they get a little bit more independent, but they're still completely reliant on her. And then it's really quite sudden. About their third spring, mom's like, See you you're out of here. <laughs> third spring. And then yep. don't they start mating soon after that? Aren't they in their fourth or fifth year? I think they're yeah, right they've got to get through a couple of years. Um, like humans, um, for the immature or juvenile polar bears, that's the most difficult time in life. You know, it's like a, some researchers will informally you know, refer to them as teenagers. You know, and, it's, and it's very difficult. They're suddenly by themselves. They don't care to be polar bears. Life's very difficult. They get bullied by the by the big adults. <laughs> Those couple years make it to about five years old, and then they become mature animals. Wow! You know what I can do is <laughs> until we do our other thing. Maybe That's I'll it. do that. It's kind of cute, but, um, I don't want to take phone calls right now. So if that's you on the line, we'll get back to you. Well. What if they're calling to ask Karen a question? Because um, we're not taking live calls tonight. Oh. Ah, there you go. Because uh, we have, there's a lot of kids that like to call in for the soapbox show. 
Oh, and, I see. you know, and they have fun, and it's like, um, I'm having fun listening to Karen. Okay. Um, what will your talk be like tomorrow? Will you read and take questions? Yeah, I think what I do is I put together a number of pictures of, of polar bears and like their, their life cycle, and everybody loves to see pictures of polar bears. Slides? They're, they're, they're great to, yeah, like PowerPoint slides, yeah. And, um, you know, everybody likes to see pictures of them. They're great to look at. And so yeah, I'll use they that. Are great to they look they at. really are. And so I'll use that to talk about them, not do a little bit of a reading. Um, and yeah, lots, lots of questions. Um, Except the very thin one in here. There's a very thin one. There is. And that's part of the story of that, that I will be telling tomorrow. Oh. Um, that, that's a very thin polar bear that uh, I saw uh, off the Alaska Arctic. Mm. And the big thing that I try to make a point of without beating people over the head with, of it with the book, is that polar bears are creatures of the sea ice. In other languages, they're called ice bears. Um, and uh, they need to be on the ice. They can swim, they can swim very well, but they don't want to be in open water for long periods. They need to be on the ice. That's where they walk, that's where they hunt, that's where their food is. Uh, there's a picture in there of a, of a very thin bear that we encountered off Alaska, where there was no ice around, really, just some ice flows, but there was no, no mm. great vast expanse of ice. Yeah, right and this poor bear had obviously been swimming for, for, for a couple of days. It was thin, it oh, was okay. unwell, uh, its fur just didn't look good, um, and it kept hopping up on a couple of ice flows, desperately trying to get onto our ship, because you could tell it could smell the food, it could smell us, um, and, and it really wanted a part of that, um, but obviously it wasn't able to, to get on. And, and you know, and as ice retreats, uh, more and more bears have to go through that. You know, so uh, so it's yeah, it's it's a, it's a really difficult time. Yeah, there he is in the book there. Uh, and then look at the other polar line. bears feeding in the town dump. Yeah, the real wow. difference between a thin polar bear that's been struggling and a good, healthy, nice, rotund, fat polar bear is is yeah, you can tell by looking at a bear pretty easily how well it's doing. If it's doing well, it's nice and fat. In captivity, what do they feed them? Seals. No, I, I'm not too sure what, what they feed them in captivity. I think it's some kind of, you know, big fatty mixture that, that they can, that they'll give them, you know, uh, blocks of lard and that kind of stuff, I think, because they really do like, they, it's all about fat. Um, one scientist who, who studies them says they shouldn't really be called carnivores, they should be called lipovores because they just really, really, it's, it's all about fat for them. Well, so. now I've got the wow. solution. You know how we have these big caverns underground where they're putting the seeds? of humanity, and we've also got a lot of cheese and, and things stored oh, yeah. in the underground. Huh. Why don't we have these big underground caverns that we refrigerate and we um, all the liposuction for all the people <laughs> that are overweight, we just feed the polar bears, yeah, we keep go. them alive, we get thinner, you're a nurse, mm -hmm. this is, this is, you know. <laughs> there, you, there you go. <laughs> polar bears aren't worrying about their cholesterol levels. Yeah, not so much. <laughs> well, my question, my next question was for Kate, being a nurse, what do you think of someone subsisting on lard? Well, we can't. Our makeup, we can't. But, you know, polar bears, evidently, that's what they the cold. do. Well, that's the thing, because it is so very cold and because they're so incredibly well adapted to be able to metabolize the fat in ways that we can. I mean, they're just incredibly efficient at using it. And the what's their life method. expectancy? Oh, in the wild, generally about 25 years or so, something like that. Females tend to live a little bit longer than males because even though polar bears don't normally fight with each other, the one time when they will fight is adult males will fight over females at mating time. And, and, and those fights can be pretty fierce just because they're very big animals and they can do a lot of damage to each other. Um, I, I include in the book a, a story of one researcher saying that he's seen, you know, a female in heat like padding along and a couple of males coming after her and one of them like his ear is half hanging off and another one is, 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 is scratched badly just from the fights between each other oh, wanting wow. the rights to... To, to mate with the female. So as a consequence, the males tend to live a little bit less, uh, less long than the females well, do. Well, you see things like that happen in human beings. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, but a little bit more. So maybe there's not a whole yeah. lot of difference. <laughs> yeah. Rarely does it get to the ear hanging off phase. <laughs> then you're in trouble. Well, Mike Tyson, but... Okay. Yeah, that's yeah, right. Mike exactly. Tyson. Exactly. Oh, uh, you say in the book that the bears are adapted to very, very cold temperatures. Now, they're warm-blooded, but they like the cold. Yes, in fact, they're so well insulated, that are so well adapted for the Arctic, that their problem is keeping cool. I mean, they are very, very well adapted. If you look often at a polar bear that's been rolling in the snow, it will get up and it'll still, the snow will stay on it for a long period of time. And as, as we all know, especially in this environment, that um, you know, if, if the snow stays on your roof, 
and it shows that your attic is well insulated and the heat isn't escaping. And that's the same thing with polar bears. They're incredibly well insulated. They're very, very good at, at absorbing heat and not releasing any of it. They're like walking furry greenhouses in many respects. Um, they are, um, their fur, even though they look white, is actually unpigmented. It just looks white to us wow. by the way that the light reflects. It really does look, they look white. Yeah, and um, all the hairs are hollow. And the advantage of that is that it just traps the air in, in the, the hair and that it helps them to you know, create a warm air blanket. Interesting, wow. Um, and their skin, if you were to shave a polar bear, which I strongly discourage anyone from trying to do because it's just going to end nastily, um, you would find that its skin is black. Wow. Uh, and again, that's another uh, uh, adaptation to staying warm because you want to, you know, black obviously is going to absorb that much more sunlight. And so you have that, and then you have a very thick layer of fat under that. So they're, they're really, really adapted to staying very, very warm. So much so, you know, that they amble along, they'll, they'll amble along at a couple of miles an hour, and they can do that for miles and miles and miles and miles and miles. But if they have to pick up the pace, even to say five or six miles an hour, then they really start to overheat if they have to do that for too long. They're capable of really explosive bursts of speed if they have to go chasing after a seal. But they just can't do it for very long periods. They are built to just amble and amble and wander and wander everything. So else. how much do you think the average male polar bear weighs, like 400 pounds? Oh gosh, no. Um, uh, uh, safe to say on average about 1,200, 1,300 oh pounds for a male. Um, certainly in excess of 1,000. Um, the scientists that I quote in my book, they, they guesstimated that the heaviest one that they ever found it to be about 1,760 pounds. Wow. Um, females are about half that size, generally around 600 pounds. But when they're pregnant, um, as I was saying, you know, they build these dens in snowdrifts, and that's where they give birth to the young bears, and, and that's where the bears grow up for the first three months of their lives. They, they never leave these dens. And so for three or four months, the female polar bear isn't eating at all and she's suckling. And so before she builds the den, she gorges, she stuffs herself. And so you see a pregnant female that's ready to make a den, she's heavily distended, really, really fat. And at that point, they'll get to, the females will get to about 800 pounds, which is about as heavy as the females get. Wow. Yeah, they're big, Amazing. big, big animals. And if they stand on their hind legs, which they're capable of doing, they can be 10, 10 feet tall plus. And how long is the pregnancy? Uh, well, it's interesting because they become uh, impregnated at some point in the spring, and then they just keep the embryos, and nothing happens over summer. And then it's very rapid because when the, uh, the cubs are born, they're tiny, they're helpless. They're like 20 ounces. Um, so it's, in a sense, it's, it's the, the embryo is held in abeyance, and then suddenly there's some cue for it to happen. And generally within a week or two, we think of her making the den, out come, out come the, the, the oh. pups. And then they grow very, very, very rapidly, of course, over, over, the, next, over the next few months. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's kind of amazing, really, that they come out and they're just so small and helpless. People don't um, realize elephants, mice, polar bears, everything has a different cycle. Right. And it, it really is worth studying. Right. The great white bear, so you put the great there for a reason. It's the, um, it's the largest bear in the world. It is, you know, it's the largest land carnivore, um, you know, and uh, you can't really sort of see a polar bear in the wild without an adjective like that um, uh, sort of sort of coming to mind. Um, the, uh, there are some of the early explorers who went to the Arctic who had no idea what they were heading into. Mm -hmm. um, right. Horrified when they first saw polar bears. Uh, as one 16th century explorer said, we saw white bears of a monstrous bigness. Um, and, just, and, and occasionally some of these guys would get shipwrecked and they'd have encounters with polar bears that they really didn't want to have. So, can I just ask about your writing process? Mm -hmm. um, so this is your third book. Mm -hmm. So what made you start writing initially? How did that, have you always written since you were Always younger? written, always written. Always liked it. I think a lot of it is down, I think all, I can really put all of these influences, you know, down to my parents. Um, you know, apparently, when I was very young, I would decide that I'd slept enough after a very short period of time, and, and you know, I'd go downstairs and I'd tell my dad, I've slept enough now. And dad, <laughs> would, and dad would read to me a little bit, and then he would actually put me in bed with something for me to read myself. And, and so he would encourage me to do that. Um, 
and so that got me into the, the whole reading yeah. thing very early on. Mm -hmm. um, and then combined with that, my father was in the Navy, and he would often show me you know, photographs of all his travels, all the places he'd seen, the people, the wildlife. And so that kind of instilled in me as I was going along uh, uh, an interest both in, in words and writing and in reading, and in specifically being interested in reading and writing about the world, and, you know, and, and, and getting that kind of wanderlust that I've had since then. So a lot of it is really down to that. Mm -hmm. Your parents were born within two months of each other. Mm -hmm. so did they know each other growing up? Here's a great story, actually. My, um, my mother knew my father's parents before she knew him. Um, she was like the local uh, district nurse in England. And my father's father was diabetic and blind. And um, my father's mother, for whatever traditionalist reasons, decided that she didn't want to give him injections. And, and so my mom would, would come by to give him the injections, and she became very fond of them, and, and would often you know, look after them, and, and at different points, you know, stay there overnight just to check up on them, make sure they were fine and everything. One night, this drunken sailor comes home on leave, come into, you know, come see his parents, and he, he for some reason, he bought a bird in the cage, and that was swinging from his finger, and he, came a little bit noisily in through the front door and suddenly this this vision of beauty emerges from the guest bedroom and comes out and says something like be quiet you horrible old drunk there are people trying to sleep here and that was how my mom met my dad <laughs> <laughs> I love it yeah it's a great yeah, story yeah it's a good story yeah that was very good fascinating I'm glad I asked you yeah yeah dad always loved telling that story uh, that and the fact that you know I'm quite a bit younger than my my two brothers I'm 13 years younger than one and 11 years younger than the other my dad would love to say with a twinkle in his ear in his eye I came home unexpectedly on leave son one day <laughs> and I was like oh got it <laughs> so your parents read your other books yes yep and um, and they were they were really you know uh, uh, first dad was very nervous when it became clear that I was going to follow a career path that involved writing about wildlife I think even though he, he liked the fact that I liked all this stuff the the image in his head was that I would go to university, I would become a very successful doctor or lawyer, of earn enough to make sure that you know, I could look after them in their dotage, and then, you know, because then when you've done all that, when you're like 40 or something like that, you can go off and do your writing, and I'm like, 40? That's like forever. So um, I went off and did that, and, but they were so supportive of me nonetheless, and they, were, they really, really did get a, a thrill out of it, and I'd hoped I'd always planned to do this and dedicate it to them, but unfortunately, they both died while I was while I was writing this, which, oh, yeah. um, which was uh, uh, a real shame actually, because I really, really this was one that I really, really wanted them to see. Um, especially when I lived in Alaska for a while, Dad always used to joke about. He used to, I think he was joking about me coming out of the front door and bumping into a polar bear, and and, and, and he loved that kind of image, and so I really did want him to see this one. But what, were uh, your parents writers? No, no, not at all. Uh, my mom was also a nurse, actually. Mm. Um, um, Dad, though, Dad certainly did like to read and write, and um, he actually had the most amazing handwriting I've ever seen. It was, it was calligraphy, really, rather than oh. handwriting. I mean, it's absolutely mm. beautiful. Just You just don't see it anymore. The people who write so beautifully, it was, uh, mm. it was always a, a, a thing to see. Um, and I'm not quite sure where, where he learned to do that, but yeah, he had the best handwriting mm. I ever saw. My horrible little spider scroll was a real disappointment to him. Well, Houghton Mifflin Harcourt is based in New York and Boston. Yep, yep. So it's a Boston, I think the Boston people contacted us this week. Yeah, the, their, their main office, the main editorial is in Boston, and uh, that's where the folks that I've been working with. And, uh, Your editor is here. Yeah, my editor is here, Lisa White, and um, uh, the other folks who, who work on the book are all based here in, in Boston. And um, so that's been one of the great things about being able to come up here. And, and cause one of the things with the, with the book writing process, of course, as you know, is oftentimes you're working with an editor and you might email and phone back and forth for a couple of years. And this is, I think we've been working on this book together for, for a good three years. And uh, this is the first time that we've met each other today. So. So that's oh the good thing about, about coming up here. But Taryn, on the other hand, is actually a uh, publicist on my previous book when she worked with a different uh, editor, the, the publicist for this book at Houghton. So that's been great to Same reconnect. publisher? Different publishers, same publicist who happened to go from one publisher to the well, other. Well, because oh, of so. the computers and everything, you don't have to meet. Like my, my editor was in Spain. I never Oh, really? Her. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, everything was, I, I just wanted to meet her at some point, and that hasn't happened. But. Kate has three books out as well. Yeah, we were talking about that earlier, actually. I was yeah. quietly mentally comparing her Amazon sales ranks to mine. <laughs> <laughs> she That's wins. Funny. Um, so at the ends of the earth, what was that 
published, uh, that was the first book? That was the first one that I did. That was published by uh, Island Press in Washington, D.C. Um, and that was really sort of a, a comparing and contrasting the Arctic and the Antarctic and, um, uh, you know, the stories of the two and, and really how um, human exploration of the polar regions led to, you know, sort of exploitation and the, you know, uh, attempts to find a way through the Northwest and the Northeast Passage back in the day um, led to the discovery of huge whale populations, which led to whaling, which really led to really fueled so much of, uh, of, of, of industry and development back, back there. And, and so it looked back and forth at the natural and unnatural history of, of those regions. And, um, and then the second book, The Whaling Season, uh, actually for a period, uh, one of my uh, roles in life was to uh, lead Greenpeace expeditions in search of Japanese whaling fleets in the Antarctic. And so we would spend Gosh, we would wow. spend about three months at sea at the time at, at a time scouring the radar and scouring the charts trying to find whaling ships and uh, pre whaling stories on the uh, the Discovery Channel. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yep, so before all of that. that. Yeah, before all of that. And um, uh, and uh, so yeah, then that was so. And also then we'd come back and then we'd work politically to try and to try and reduce and, and uh, whaling. And, and that book is sort of a history of whaling and the story of being at sea looking for whaling ships and our encounters with the whaling ships. So. I interviewed Sina Jeter Nasland, who wrote a parallel book to um, Moby Dick, Ahab's wife. Oh yeah. And she yeah. came to the New Bedford Whaling Museum. Oh right, wow. that's a place I've got to go. I haven't yet, but. And so Dinky Dawson, the sound engineer for Fleetwood Mac, Lou Reed, we're colleagues, we're writing together. Mm -hmm. He drove all the way down to New Bedford. He's in, on Cape Cod, and I went down there and we interviewed her there. It's fascinating to do it in the Whaling Museum, but it's creepy to me that these poor creatures were slaughtered. Mm. Mm, it's such vast numbers as well. Yeah, yeah but yeah. Um, you know, I should pull that one out and rerun it because oh, interesting. we've got about 550 hours of programming. Right. So, I mean, you know, it, you know finding them in the basement and digitizing them. But it's important because that was a nice setting and, and where you're doing this work. This is important work, Karen. Thank you. I'm glad you're, you know, you're getting it out there. What was the publisher? Was that the same publisher as the first book, the second? The second one was the, the first two were the same publisher, Island Press, yeah, so. Okay, I'm not Herb Island. They're a small outfit based out of Washington, D.C. They, uh, they do primarily environmental type titles. Oh, cool. Um, in fact, I think exclusively, actually. No uh, slight against them. I mean, you know. No, yeah, yeah, I think, they, I think they do that exclusively, so. Yeah, just from the titles, they sound important. Mm. Um, and you do things for Discovery News? Yes, yeah, I blog for the Discovery News site, um, so that's, that's, that's fun and that's great because... The Discovery Channel. That's correct, yes. Um, you know, their website, they have the one website that obviously is all about their programming and they also have news because people, you know, want Discovery to go to Discovery to learn about pretty much everything, right? And so on a daily basis we'll have news up there about space, about the Earth, about mm -hmm. archaeology and history and all the things that you, and animals, all the things you expect Discovery to, to, to cover. So you could almost see this as a, um, the Great White Bear as a documentary on Discovery. Oh, absolutely. We'd I mean, actually I think that would be perfect. Yeah, we'd actually I hope. I just visualize it, yeah. you know. Oh, I'd, yeah. yeah. Preach on! I'd love to. Um, we'd actually hoped to be able to get a, a camera man up with us uh, when I went up to Churchill, and it just didn't work out for, for budgetary reasons. But um, no, it was because they're, they're so telegenic. I mean, I mean, polar bears are your perfect, uh, the perfect stars. I, there's something I just right love about turning on the Discovery Channel and hearing about different animals and the and the tone of voice they use, and they start out and they do this. I'm fascinated because mm. I, I wasn't brought up with animals or knowing animals and it's like a whole new world to me mm. you know flipping on that discovery and learning all this it's perfect you can just you can just put on any of them right and then you can just sit there and watch them for hours it doesn't matter what comes up next it's, it's yeah. always yeah, yeah yeah it's very cool yeah i love the cover it's very discovery isn't it great isn't, it? isn't it good you know you want to hug it you want to pat it uh, I'm not shouldn't. sure who the photographer is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you should definitely shouldn't. But it was great, and I loved the process. Um, the you know Houghton Mifflin were great. They worked on a number of different design concepts, oh. and so it's you know you kind of look. Oh, do you like this? Do you like that? Which one works? Which one? And so forth, and uh, and worked that one out internally. And I really like it, and I like the format as well. It's a slightly smaller than than your standard book, and I think that just fits very nicely. Yeah, I like that book. you can put it in your hand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
yeah, fit in a pocketbook nice even when you yeah. go to the airport. Yeah, yeah, yeah I like that. I don't have a pocketbook. <laughs> yeah. and, and I very deliberately, it's funny, when I, did, <laughs> when I did the proposal, at first I wanted to do, you know, like the ultimate 600 page book about polar bears, and my agent was like, you know, why don't you do something even a little bit less than half of that? And I'm really happy that I did that. It sort of went to its natural length. I just wrote until it, you know, had a natural length to it. And I like the fact that it's, you know, it's, it's concise. It's not an intimidating read, I think. It's, you can sit down and you can read it and, and you can get what you need to know about polar bears relatively easily. That's the point, too. I think people need condensed. Yeah, I think so. You look at Ahab's wife and it's like, oh my God, daunting. But they were really pushing the book, so I said, okay, this, I got into it. It was, it was she's a good writer. Hmm. And it was fascinating to meet her. Hmm. Um, but it was so thick. Right. I mean, she really People liked can get turned off looking at a thick book. That's what was yeah. told to me, because yeah. my book, my last book, two weeks since my last confession, actually was about 900 pages. And um, they said, absolutely not. Just <laughs> <laughs> like, cut that and make it a third of that, even. Right. So. Right. I, I had to leave out a whole lot. Mm -hmm. I know how busy you are. How do you write 900 pages with your life? And then Kieran, you know. I don't know, Joe. No. <laughs> it was just, that's just me. And it's then he's running around the globe. Yes. Do you do it all on computer? Yes. Yeah. I used to, when I started writing, um, and I had typewriters, I would do, like, I would always do, like, a draft in longhand. And then yeah. do a badly typed draft, and then try to you know do the the nice double space draft after that. And, and do you I do a lot of editing yourself initially? Yes, I do. Um, I find it kind of, and sometimes I I don't know if, if you find this the same. Sometimes I, I stall myself because I'm trying to edit too much as I go along. And I think sometimes I find that. Uh, I create a little bit of a log jam, and sometimes I just need to let myself write, and then I figure, well, I can go back and edit it. It's, it's okay. So, um, uh, and also sometimes when I find that I am having a hard time with it, with writing it, I think that's well, probably because it's just not very good. And let's just get rid of it and start it again. And um, I think when I have the most trouble with writing, it's because the writing that I'm doing isn't actually very when good. When do you write? What time of day mostly? Well, my ideal scenario is that, you know, if, say, I have a bunch of things to do, you know, clean the house, go shopping, do this, do a little, couple of little bits of writing, that I like to try and, like, give a day over to doing those. Because, personally, if it's, to, if it's long form writing, um, I have a hard time starting that two-thirds of the way through the day. Mm -hmm. I like to be able to, if possible, if, when my life allows it, to sit down and spend a day, the full day, working on something like this. And then I can do because it's easy for me to then go and do a blog or something in the evening, something like that. But I find it's just the way I am. I think I find that if I start doing too many other things, that I find it very hard to really focus. Yeah, by the yeah. by, by the afternoon it's like done, and I might as well just do a whole bunch of other little things. That's mm -hmm. that's the way that I find. Yeah, yeah, but he's so different. Mm. If you go on vacation, do you take your computer and write? You know, it's funny. I write longhand. I can't get my thoughts down initially unless it's longhand. Oh I've my tried. God. Interesting. And so then I'm in the process because I have my fourth book I'm working on and I'm just starting to transfer it over into the computer. And for some reason I'm finding that very simple to do. I, I don't mm. know. It's more work. Mm. I realize that. But, but I just can't get time. it down. Mm. It, I think it's all about, well, I started to write because of, you know, some incidents that happened to me in a my counselor said to me, you should write those down. Writing helps in the healing process. So that's what I started to do when I was writing away. And so I think that's in my mind that a lot of it's healing for me to do my writing. Right, right, right. So you actually do, it's not even just the case of sketching out the notes longhand. You, you actually do the writing. You write the manuscript yeah. longhand. Oh, interesting. Yeah. I mean, because I do a lot of notes long. I mean, I've always got bits of paper around and a pen. Just if something pops into my head, yeah, I notes always are do big. that. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm finding, though, with this one, it's a little bit different. I'm not as long-winded writing. I say, oh, I, I know what I'm going to say when I put it onto the computer. Mm, so mm. it's a little different. Mm. Well, you've done all these lectures now. She's done a lot of lectures. Oh, okay. I just taped her in a snowstorm at Stoneham Library. Mm. Oh, yeah, yeah. But uh, are you doing libraries on the tour? Or? No, not really. I think basically apart from so far, apart from being here, it's, it's all a virtual tour. It's all... Uh, very radio station oriented, having them call in and, and, and speak right. to them. And uh, apart from anything else, it's just so much more cost effective, both in terms of 
you know, what it costs to fly from place to place and also what it costs for you energetically, you know, to travel from place to place. I mean, I don't know about you, but I've gone to places, you know, flown over to Seattle to do a book signing and no one's shown up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? No oh, yeah. So I think the more you can kind of talk, and that's, that's a good humbling experience, that's oh, for yes. sure. There's nothing like sitting at the desk and I did a book signing it's for at the ends of the earth actually in a Seattle bookstore and it was set up for one lunchtime. It was obvious like a busy bookstore and a lot of people go there for lunch. Nobody, nobody wanted to, to, to buy the book. And after a while, the people who obviously like to spend the full hour, lunch hour browsing in the bookstore, they, they just looked embarrassed every time they walked past me because they just, you could tell they felt kind of embarrassed and guilty and oh, maybe I should buy the guy's book, you know, but, but no, yeah, nobody I, did, I, <laughs> nobody did. I don't like book signings for no, that reason. Right, yeah. And it's, you shouldn't take it personally no. because people, sometimes people are intimidated by the writer, the author, and they don't want to go over, you know, mm. they're, you know. Yeah, I think if you're already a celebrity, then it's one yes. thing, but, but otherwise, yeah, it, it could be quite difficult. I mean, I mean, the event like tomorrow at the museum is perfect, of course, because that's going to be, you know, ideal. People can just come and just listen and uh, have a thing about polar bears I without the being I can picture you at libraries, though. Wouldn't he have been good at the Stoneham where I was? Yeah. Oh, sure, sure. Or I think libraries, yeah, and, mm -hmm. and they do. Kate's done really well. The Reading oh, yeah. was packed. The, the oh, libraries yeah. have been good for me. I like that. You mm. give a talk. I talk for 45 minutes, 50 minutes, and then questions and answers. And then I do have books with me, so people tend right. to buy some. Right. So it's, it's more than one um, avenue to go. Now, on the weekend, you, you may be interviewed by Craig Fenton. Um, he is a Jefferson Airplane biographer and Jefferson Starship biographer. Oh, yes. So he's, he's a tremendous writer and um, great interviewer. But the reason I set him up with your publicist is his girlfriend is Becky the Polar Bear. I'm thinking, okay. Becky the Polar Bear. Becky the Polar Bear is his girlfriend. And so it's like, okay, so he's going to interview Karen. <laughs> and, uh, so it's like I should be interviewing him. <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> but uh, there's a little aside when if, if you do the interview with him this weekend, he'll podcast it on the web. Ah, okay. On his Jefferson Starship site. So a lot oh, of Jefferson fantastic. Airplane fans will be tuning into your... Oh, excellent. Uh, excellent. Maybe Grace will buy a copy. Huh? You never Who know. Knows, yeah. right? They all, they all know so. Craig because he's... There's two main biographers of the airplane, Jeff Tamarkin mm -hmm. and uh, Craig Fenton. And they're both friends of mine. They're on my Facebook. Mm -hmm. uh, and... and, and they're fascinating people that they documented this iconic band that hasn't had as much documentation as you think. Oh, really? They're not. But Is Craig Gracie Slick still around? Oh, yeah, but she, she came to the Burlington Mall and I missed her. Oh, she was the, she's an artist. She no, brings these right. marble oh, slabs oh. to stand on because her feet are in terrible condition. Hmm. So she stands on these marble slabs with her artwork at the malls. Really? Was she paints? Yeah. Oh. Marty Ballon paints, too, the lead singer. Hmm. And, um... And so Marty and Grace paint, and they have these, you know, art, like you have an agent for your book, they have these art agents, and they go on tour, and, you know, and Marty's going to come up here, and do, he does his art and his music, sings Miracles, and there's the paintings, oh, James yeah. Joplin and Jerry Garcia. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. It's just cool stuff. Yeah. Um, but, so, so that's someone that's probably interviewing you, and um, you can ask him all the airplane questions, why he knows everything. <laughs> Airplanes over Antarctica. Um, we got to get you to autograph these. Yes, We've got absolutely. about another five minutes, and Frank will be calling in. Okay. And um, we'd love to talk movies. You know, I was going to talk to Kate tonight about Ashton Kutcher. Do you get? Do you catch many movies? Not as many as I used to. You know, I, I used to really enjoy going to the movies, and um, I actually find the experience of being in a movie theater less pleasant than I used to find it. Um, you know, it's just uh, I, I don't know. Like people's behavior in public doesn't seem to be quite what it used to be, I, I don't mm -hmm. know really, so just fine, and it's expensive, so, um, you know, but, but I will, you know, I, I do like to sit down and watch movies at home, um, that's for sure. I had, I reviewed the uh, Ashton Kutcher, uh, Natalie Portman movie, mm. um, no, no strings, strings attached. attached, no strings attached, right. and I told Kate, I said, you know, I'm no prude, there's like all these 20-somethings and teenagers in the audience, and this movie is just like really Risque, raunchy. beyond risque. Mm, mm, mm. Raunchy. Yeah, mm. raunchy. Last Tango in Paris has nothing on this. Really? And it got an R rating, and I'm thinking, this, okay, this is really an X movie. This is an X. Mm. But they want that R rating to get the kids Precisely, in. Precisely, yeah. And, and, you know, I'm just thinking, you know, stay at home and read about the polar bears and do something <laughs> for humanity. But, like, you know, watching know. Natalie and Ashton go at it. Yeah. I ended up seeing it. Oh, did you? 
I, I did, and I, I felt even. Was it as bad as I thought it was? Oh, it was. I'm glad I wasn't with one of my children. Mm. It was that mm. bad. Mm. Okay, good. So it wasn't just me. It was. It was raunchy. It yeah. was. It was almost like, don't these actors and actresses have some morals? Mm. Like the whole world's going to see this, mm. and the way they're acting. <laughs> Natalie Portman always struck me as the kind of person who didn't do that kind of thing. Here we go. We're going to take a call. You are on Visual Radio Live. Yeah, this is Frank Delastrito. I'll call him and talk about movies. Wow, I have authors galore here. I have Frank Delastrito, Karen Mulvaney, and Kay Genovese all on the show right now. All right. Well, uh, I'm impressed. I'm, I'm honored to be with that company. <laughs> hey, uh, Frank, are you back home? I'm back. I'm back in uh, Texas. So you and the wife are finished with the journey? Yes. They, they, Frank was kind enough to, his wife let him call in on the journey oh, yeah. to do oh. the movie reviews. Um, right. So what movie are you showing tonight? Tonight we're showing Terror by Night with Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce. And Kieran, Kieran our guest, is from Britain. Uh, originally okay. so, yep. And isn't Basil Rathbone from? He was. Actually, Basil so. Rathbone was so. uh, South African. Oh, was he? Thing. Yeah, I think I think he went as a young man to live in England, but he was born in uh, I think I think it was Johannesburg, but he was definitely South African. So uh, I think he was in Britain when World War One broke out because he definitely fought in the British Army. And uh, and if you're from Britain, then this movie starts in England and it ends in Scotland because it all takes place on a train. And there's a murder on the train, and Holmes is trying to solve it before the train gets to where it's going. So they do cross the border. And there's a jurisdictional dispute between the Scottish police and the English police, which I guess happens every now and then. I don't know. But this, this raises a question. If you kill a person on a train and you kill them in England and the train goes into Scotland, who's in charge? I don't know. So Roy William Neal directed this. Did he direct all of them? Do you know, Frank? He didn't direct all of them, but he directed a good many of them. And he also directed uh, Frankenstein Meets the Wolfman. Oh, truly. Did he? Ah. And he, you know, he did a lot, he did a lot of stuff. I, th I think he did a lot of westerns, but he, uh, but he was, uh, he was a workhorse director for Universal during the, during the forties. Let's see. I just called up his credits of the Sherlock Holmeses. He directed one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. That's pretty. Eleven. Eleven out of fourteen. So that's wow. not bad. So. Uh, yeah, he did, he did them, and in the middle came Frankenstein Meets the Wolfman. <laughs> and uh, there is one actor who is in all those movies, and that's Inspector Lestrade, because he actually, uh, Dennis Hoey, who played Inspector Lestrade, pops up in Frankenstein Meets the Wolfman. Oh, oh really? Wow. Well, let me see. I guess he's not in Sherlock Holmes in Washington, so he's not in all of them, but he's, <laughs> he's, the, he's the crossover between the, the horror movies and the, um, and the Sherlock Holmes movies. So, uh, have you seen this movie? I have not. I've been busy, busy. Okay. Well, this is a this is a treat. I'm I'm surprised that my movie of this caliber is in the public domain, but I guess somehow they somebody forgot to renew the renew the uh, copyright on it, and maybe it fell into the public domain as movies sometimes do. Are you in fact, if you go on Wikipedia that? and put in public domain movies, well, you sent me that link. You read that. How anybody figures out whether a movie is in public domain or not is beyond me. But some of these old movies, you know. Trying to prove they were not in the public domain would be, be quite an effort. Well, as I told Karen, if I buy them for a dollar, I know they're public domain. Yeah, that's, that's a pretty good bet. Or if you can watch them uh, online right, mm. for free, that's a pretty good bet they're in public domain. So basically, all the movie, every movie eventually winds up in public domain. It's only a matter of time. Frank, uh, my co-host Kate is on her fourth book. Actually, her fifth, but she doesn't talk about the first one. Oh, well, Here, we, none of us talk about our first book, but we don't get those published anyway, so nobody cares. Now, are you running your fourth, Karen? Uh, not quite. I'm still kind of uh, circling around and figuring out exactly what it's going to be. Okay. But we're at the stage Karen of... Karen, a novelist or a uh, non-fiction writer or what? Non-fiction. Dreadful at fiction. Okay, and, and, uh, and what, have, what have you written? He's the Great White Bear is his book tonight, A Natural and Unnatural History of the Polar Bear. And I did want to ask him another question, if you don't mind, Frank. What do you mean unnatural history? Well, it's the story of what makes a polar bear a polar bear um, and how they live on the ice and, and it's their, their life history. 
And then it's also, it, it moves steadily into their encounters with humans, you know, be it from early explorers who would go up there and have these encounters with them, um, uh, or to more modern times them being hunted, or now, you know, their environment being under threat. So, so it's a combination of both. We could do a Sherlock Holmes movie on, on the, the <laughs> uh, destruction of the polar bear. Yeah, there you go. That would be kind of easy to solve. Yeah, I don't think it needs Sherlock Holmes, though, actually. Watson okay. probably do that one by himself. Karen, have you ever heard of Fletcher's Ice Island T3? I have not. Okay, I w actually, I spent five months in the Arctic when I was a young man. Oh, okay. And, and I was there in the summer, and it was, it was manned, and it was the, I guess so, uh, manned is the proper word, because I don't think a woman ever got there. And that was the first summer where we did not see a polar bear, and I was looking forward to seeing one. Oh, of yeah. a, a seal, in fact, the seal bit me up there. <laughs> But we didn't see a polar bear, but everybody told stories about them, and that basically you'd be glad you don't, because if it sets its sight on you, you're, you're a goner. Yeah, yeah, everyone, uh, I mean, that's certainly one of my experiences, too, is that, yeah, there's uh, anyone who's spent enough time up there, they've all got the bear stories. Oh, fascinating. So, did you get to see your movies up there, uh, Frank? A poll? Yeah. <laughs> Not many. In those days, it was whatever was on a reel. So, this is 1971, there were no videos, no no. You know, no VHSs or DVDs. But did they have pro public broadcast up there? No, we had nothing. We, uh, I mean, the, some of the radio operators could pick up, could occasionally, p you know, if you're in the commercial business, why broadcast to the North Pole with nobody else? Right. <laughs> so, uh, so some of the radio guys could occasionally pick up stations, but not. So the movies we had were uh, uh, The Brothers Karamazov. I, I, by the way, I saw all these movies like 20 times maybe more than 20 times, because they show one every night, and I was up there five months. <laughs> and uh, so Brothers Karamazov uh, with Jewel Brenner. Uh, how they got these movies, I have no idea. The Jolson story with uh, Larry Parks, the split with uh, Jimmy, Jane, Jimmy Brown, Jim Brown, the football player. And I, the thing is, I, I, uh, you know, no matter how bad a movie is, if you watch it enough times, you start to get a certain affection for it. So <laughs> these, weren't, these weren't bad movies, but you, but I... You start to get a, you get a certain love for them, and I haven't seen one since. So I saw these are, if you listen to the movies I have seen most often in my life, these would probably be in the top 25 because I saw them once a week for five months, but I haven't seen any one of them since. <laughs> wow. Hey, um, Frank, Dress to Kill, the Sherlock Holmes movie, was 70 minutes. Terror by Night's only 60. Do you know why they were so short? Well, they tend, I mean, uh, for instance, you know, a, a little statistic, the 90, uh, the longest Frankenstein movie Universal ever made was 91 minutes. Most of them were, were 75 minutes or other. In those days, people wanted a double bill. Ah, of course. And mm -hmm. if you were made for the second half of a double bill, you tend to be a shorter movie. Mm -hmm. So the, the uh, you know, the, the prime features might reach an hour and a half. Occasionally it went over, but not often. But your second features would be between 60 minutes and 80 would be on the outside. Uh, a lot of them were, well, like The Raven, or, you know, Bela Lugosi, Boris Karloff, it was 61 minutes. Okay. It, was, it was meant to be part of a double bill. When they opened in New York, they'd be single features, but by the time they hit the neighborhoods, they were meant to be. And uh, movies did tend to get longer over time. Uh, you gotta understand at the time, the movie studios own the theaters. So if you can, you know, movie theater owners hate long movies because they can't get as many showings in per day. Right. Like a a three-hour movie will show four times a day, whereas a, a, uh, a two-hour movie will show five times a day. And uh, if, you're not wor you know, if, you, if you're not worried about your keeping your theater full or whatever, that means you get more, you get more showings. So there's a lot, I mean, there's, there's pretty few movies that come out now that are over two hours, because uh, business-wise, that means they lose a showing per day, and, and they might feel that at the box office. So, uh, I'm sorry, two-hour movie, and you're the man, you're the man, you know these things, this is incredible, but keep talking, Frank, or, or Karen, or Kate, because okay, I, well, uh, like I, I remember when the, uh, when the Godfather came out, it was... It's, oh, it's well over two hours, and that was kind of a stir at the time. Mm. I mean, there had been, you know, had been these big epics, like Gone with the Wind is, is, you know, is famous. It's almost four hours. Then, her, I think, is over four hours. I don't have the running time from you, but it's, it's, it's a long 
those those uh, those movies tended to die out, and they be, and finding something over two hours now is not that common. And I remember when The Godfather came out because people didn't know how it was going to do it. It was a mega hit, and uh, but a lot of people didn't see that coming, and they thought they were shooting themselves in the foot by uh, by making it a long movie, but but it worked, you know, and. Do people want to sit around for three hours? Well, they will if it's a good movie. They won't if it's a bad movie. My mic is very noisy tonight, which is very unprofessional of me, but I've got the Eagle poster. I was supposed uh, to interview Channing Tatum this week, and the train breaks down. We can't talk about the movie, but I will say it's two hours. I can talk about it next Friday, because it comes out next Friday. Wh what Eagle are you talking about? The Eagle of the Ninth, which is... Uh, in the year 140 AD, it's very well done, mm -hmm. and I can't talk about it because it's uh, okay. Now talk. I know what you're talking about. I'm sorry, but uh, that's all right. Um, we will discuss it next week before we go into our next movie, which w you and I and Joe will figure out what that will be. Maybe it'll be a polar bear movie. Any polar bears in the public domain? Uh, I'm trying to think of it's a good polar bear movie, but uh, uh, you know, unless you find some old. Uh, uh, a bird documentary or something like that. I'm not. Sh I'm not quite sure what it would be. Mm. I. I am ashamed to admit I've never seen Abbott and Costello's Lost in Alaska. I don't know if a <laughs> polar bear shows up in that or not. It's got to be polar bears in movies, but I'm drawing a mental blank. But I. I. I I'm ashamed to say I can't think of one. Yeah. Um, what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to thank Kate Genovese. I want everyone to sit here. Well, wasn't this cool having two? It's very nice. Yeah, it's we, been yeah. great. Thank you. We had you surrounded, but. Uh, Karen's a great guest, Karen Mulvaney. You're welcome back anytime. Thank you. I'd love to come back. Kate might be welcome back too. She's <laughs> always welcome here. Uh, and then we're gonna we're gonna close up with talking about Terror by Night, which is when our show ends, folks. The public domain movie begins. It won't be the Eagle, but uh, I love these old movies, and I, I do want to watch this one, Frank. Oh yeah, yeah. This is a good movie. Uh, you. I think people might think it has a weak ending because you can figure out what's happening and usually you like to be hit in the face with, oh, that's how he figured it out and all that. Uh, there's, some, there's, uh, there's some great moments in there when Sherlock Holmes is pushed out of the train and has to fight for his life.